Okay, we're rolling again. Welcome back to Beyond Networks, the evolution of living systems. The last time we talked about perspectival realism. And I'm just going to repeat some of the main points that came up during that lecture. The first one is that as limited beings, that's very important, we can't have a God's eye view of the world. We can't step out of our own heads and sort of see the universe from outside. A view from nowhere, it's been called as well. Our perspectives are more than just opinions or subjectives point of view, though. Within those perspectives, we can use uh, methodological naturalism, which means that the perspectives, the scientific perspectives we have, can be pragmatically justified. You know, kind of like science works better than other things for practical matters. The, claim, uh, the claims one can make from any one perspectives are limited, though. Okay, so we have um limited access to the universe we have limited experience we are limited by our senses and we are biased by our assumptions by comparing perspectives we can learn something about these limitations so we can do that by per, uh, comparing perspectives between individuals but also across times or maybe even rivaling perspectives in science that exist at any one time so it's really interesting to, to examine controversies um, or famous scientists, geniuses that hold completely wrong beliefs. And we can learn something from those sort of instances as well. So science isn't progressing as smoothly and asymptotically towards truth as uh, naive realism would, would like us to believe. So, but the, the problem is, sometimes you can get stuck in a perspective. And that's a real problem. And one of the best examples for that we have in modern science is biology. Biology, more than any other science I know, is massively stuck in one single perspective. You could sort of illustrate that with the streetlight effect, also called the drunkard's search principle. It's typically a man, could be a woman, um, who lost their keys and uh, in the dark, but are looking for them under the streetlight. And when um, a passerby is coming and asks them, what are you doing here? I see no keys. They say, We're, I'm looking for the keys here where there is light. Okay, so that's what happens when you're stuck in one single perspective. You may be finding all kinds of interesting things within that cone of light, but not really what you're looking for. And that's really important. The perspective we're stuck in, in biology, of course, is that of genetic reductionism. Reductionism is funny in particular because it comes from physics. And sometimes biologists, as biologists, we have a bit of physics envy because they have all, they have it easy, right? Traditionally, physics is the subject in science which chose all the, the uh, problems that were uh, ready to tackle hundreds of years ago. So they, they, they really chose the easy problems and we're stuck with the complicated sort of questions about life and ecosystems and things like that. So it's a bit ironic that we use a, a very simplified sort of reductionist approach predominantly in biology today, while physics has a hundred years ago already moved on from that simplifying view. So let's have a quick look at how this happened. And it all goes back to a medieval monk called William of Ockham and his famous razor. In Latin, it's called Lex Parsimonia, the law of parsimony. And I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Occam's maxim. And he said, if you're a scientist and you have difficult, the different hypotheses about the world, then you should choose the one with the fewest assumptions. Okay, and that works fine in a lot of different contexts. Now, if you're studying something incredibly complex, like the evolution of living systems, this may not be a good thing. And indeed it isn't. So we need to step out of the reductionist perspective urgently, okay? It's, it's hindering progress in biology. It's time to move on. And a little bit this is happening with systems biology, but we're uh, gonna discuss how, how that progress is very limited so far. We're not going far enough. 
So what happened is that, it, is that Occam's razor in the case of biology and of course the social science has become Occam's eraser. It has gotten rid of too many things because what it does is it, it basically gets rid of superfluous ontological apparatus to say it in philosophy speak. What does that mean? What is ontological apparatus? Just very briefly, we're gonna switch in this lecture from epistemology, we've looked at that in the last two lectures, to the topic of metaphysics, okay? And the metaphysics is the branch of philosophy that deals with the first principles of things, including abstract concepts such as being, knowledge, identity, time, and space. In particular, we're gonna use ontology, which is the branch of metaphysics that deals with the nature of being. It tells us, or it makes us think at least, what exists? What are the entities in the world that are real? And what is not real? Of course, that's an important question for uh, a scientific realist. And what happened is that from physics, what we got is a sort of a, you could call it uh, a desert ontology, sort of an Occam's razor ontology. Reductionism tells us that only sort of the bottom layer of the universe, we're bottoming out, only the, the you know, fundamental particles are real. And those physicists like Steve Weinberg who are looking for this final theory, they are trying to derive a theory that explains everything in the universe from those fundamental particles and the forces that connect them. Now, this is a very sort of peculiar point of view. Of course, it's been massively successful, not only in physics, also in molecular biology, but it's been criticized, especially by one of the most underrated uh, philosophers of science and philosophers in general today, Bill Wimsatt, he's still alive and kicking. Uh, he came up with this term desert ontology. And he said, and I'm going to give you a wonderful um, Wimsat quote to introduce him and his writing style. So he said this sort of simplification of the world down to its fundamental particles. He calls this ontological genocide. And this genocide, he says, was practiced upon whole classes of upper level or derivative entities in the name of elegance. And we were secure in the belief that one strayed irremediably into the realm of conceptual confusion and possible error, the further one got from ontic fundamentalism. What on earth does that mean? Ontological genocide is sort of uh, the elimination of entities that are not fundamental. And that is what's called ontic fundamentalism. If you believe in this desert ontology, if you believe that you can derive everything from particle physics, then you're an ontic fundamentalist. That's not a form of terrorism, but a philosophical stance. Okay, so Wimsat is saying it was wrong to throw all the other stuff out. And he has this wonderful drawing in his book that I heavily recommend. It's a complicated and long book. It's called Re-Engineering Philosophy for Limited Beings. If you only read one philosophy book, as a biologist, I hope it is this one. And this illustration tells you that our world consists of many different levels of complexity of scale, also time scales. So what we're seeing here is sort of a, a, a levels of different uh, spatial scales. It starts with the atomic level uh, on the left side. And as we go up the space scale, uh, we see there's a molecular level, macromolecules, unicellular level, and then it gets a bit more messier up there. So you have smaller um, metazoans and larger metazoans, and then social, cultural, uh, and ecological organizations. You see that the ants, they span um, different levels. So as you go up this sort of um, uh, hierarchy, it gets more and more complicated. Um, and this is a wonderful picture. So basically, Wimsat is telling us all 
these entities at all these different levels are real. Okay. And we're very familiar as biologists with pictures like that, but we, we sort of rarely think about them. This is from a textbook, a general biology textbook uh, from 2010. And how many textbooks have you seen that have this sort of diagram where you have, you know, atoms at the bottom and then ecosystems at the top? So it's sort of natural for biologists to think in terms of levels of organization, but funnily enough, very few people think about what those levels really mean and what they imply. There's a bunch of philosophers that I know that work on this and it's a very interesting topic. What's important here is that we should question this idea that only fundamental entities are real. And this gives us a more, much more a, a richer picture of the world. Compared to the desert ontology, Wimsett has this beautiful picture of a rainforest ontology, a lush rainforest that's thriving, like the one on the picture here. Our world is not like a desert, he writes, but has the interdependent ontology of the tropical rainforest. So it's a sort of ecological view, and our focus is on the interactions between entities within levels at different levels. This is a perspective that is much more appropriate to modern cosmology than this desert Okay, so there's much more to the world than physics. And this idea that all the sciences rest on physics and can be reduced to physics, we have to revise that. If you think about it, biology is richer. There are things in biology that you cannot only explain through the laws of physics, like natural selection. It requires additional principles. It doesn't sort of violate any physico-chemical laws, but Physics and chemistry alone will not be able to explain all the biological phenomena. It is also profoundly evolutionary. This forest is constantly growing and changing. So this is not a fixed picture. Levels of organizations are like ecosystems. They evolve as a product of the evolutionary trajectories of the entities that compose uh, a level. And they provide selection forces that guide their evolution in turn. This is beautiful because this provides a very fundamental principle that's going to come back over and over again in this lecture. And that is, it's not only the parts of a bigger system that influence the system, but it's also the system that influences the parts. In this case, the level of organization can constrain and thereby guide the evolution of the entities at that level. And at the same time, the level is made up from those entities themselves. So in this sense, levels define co-evolving niches for their composing entities. They provide a home for those entities. And I find this a, a profoundly fascinating concept that is only now being explored. But what that means in particular is that we should not reduce everything to the bottom. We should not bottom out, not to atoms. And also in biology, of course, for genetic reductionism, this means we shouldn't try and explain all the phenomena in biology at the level of the genes. That just won't work. There are many different phenomena at different levels that are important and have causal agency. We're, we're going to come back to that in a later lecture. So we cannot just shut them out and think, once we read all the genes in a genome, we have a program that makes an organism. That is a fallacy of genetic reductionism. So let's take this a bit further because what I've shown you before, this levels of organization diagram was only a very small part of Wimsat's uh, drawing, which is wonderful. So Wimsat, after drawing these levels of organization, starts to wonder, what do these levels actually mean? And so we have two axes here on this graph. One is, we've already encountered that, is a, an increasing size, so uh, a logarithmic scale of sizes. Okay, so we go up um, the size scale. But here, and that's interesting, on the vertical axis, you have what he calls regularity and predictability. So whenever you have a peak here, um, there is some sort of, uh, level at which you can formulate models 
maybe even laws of nature. We'll come back to that problem later on. And so Wimsatt starts wondering, how does our world really look like? Does it look like this regular, neatly spaced levels and everything is very uh, cleanly separable? This was the traditional view of this hierarchy of sciences. You know, physics is busy with the atomic level, chemistry with the molecular, biochemistry with the ma macromolecular and then biology, uh, the life sciences and the social sciences uh, come, out, uh, come up uh, in these levels. It's much more complicated. And that already gives us an indication that these levels aren't as cleanly separated and as um, uh, regular as in this picture. So it could be, if we're really uh, unlucky, that the regularity in the universe looks like this. It's totally random across levels. So this would be, there's no order uh, in the universe. And he writes here, well, is that, that would probably indicate that we have the wrong choice of variable when modeling or, or looking um, at the universe. So, so if we detect the universe like this, either we should just give up because there is no order to the universe at all, or we have to sort of seriously rethink uh, how we are carving up reality. Maybe we just have the wrong uh, kind of variables for our model. Another um, sort of terrible possibility is that there is nothing at all, right? Everything's the same. Again, it'll be very difficult to, to figure out how this works. It's funny, he calls this nature as an invertebrate. <coughs> Excuse me. This is just a uh, uh, poll analogy, no viruses. Okay, so this is sort of a worst case scenario as well, right? So it's, it's totally flat. There is no structure, no vertebrae to this. This is a metaphor, of course, with the vertebrae. Another sort of option is that the universe looks like this. So we have cleanly separated um, and clearly defined levels up here and everything is a bit wishy-washy here. But as I just said before, it seems like it is exactly the opposite. Our world, which is here, looks like this. So as we go down into the realms of the atoms, the molecules, everything is clear and you can clearly separate laws that, that operate at different levels. But if you come up here into the biological and the social realm, it becomes much more complicated and it's not quite as easy to separate everything into clean levels. And this is why it's much harder to come up with general theories uh, in biology than it is in physics, of course. We'll come back to that topic as well. This is my uh, second most favorite drawing in the book. My most favorite drawing is this insane um, uh, phylogram here, uh, which depicts sort of the causal structure as it could be in the universe. And it's illustrative. Of course, Bill Wimsatt doesn't claim that he knows how the universe is structured, but it seems from that other uh, diagram that it's a bit like this. You can see uh, that the atomic level is here at the very root, of course. There's a disconnect to, to uh, cosmological large-scale objects up here, so there's in physics still a disconnect between the very small uh, described by quantum mechanics and the very large, as in relativity theory. But it's not, it's very straightforward, okay? So there are clear sort of causal connections and it's not too complicated. But it's, if you move up here to organic molecules, macromolecules, and then up into this, it becomes really complicated. And he calls this area of reality here the biopsychological thicket. This is where all the phenomena we're dealing with and the life sciences and the social sciences are happening. And this is why it's so much harder to do biology than it is to do physics. The problems, the, the theories that they have in physics may be uh, sophisticated, very formal, and you need to learn a lot of math to understand them, but the problems we're dealing with in biology are much more complex than the ones uh, physicists outside of condensed matter physics are traditionally dealing with. So this is not clearly structured into levels or anything else. It looks like a hairball something your cat pukes up. Um, and we need a, a sort of a different strategy, obviously, to cut through this than the physicists 
need to have to cut through these much more cleanly and more simple or you know organized large scale organized or small scale organized parts of the world so how do we do this and this is exactly where these perspectives become so important and why they weren't picked up by philosophers who dealt with physics um, Wimsat has his own definition of perspectives he says they are intriguingly quasi-subjective, or at least observer technique or technology relative cuts on the phenomena characteristic of a system, which needn't be bound to given levels. They cut through this hairball and they don't care about levels. So a lot of the theories, the perspectives, the models we have in biology, they go across levels. And one of the main characterizing features of life, of course, is that it's a phenomen, uh, phenomenon that's coherent across so many levels. And that's why reductionism doesn't work or is very limited in the biological realm. So what's more, what's more important even is that each system can be characterized by multiple perspectives, especially if it is a complex system. In fact, Wimsatt's definition of complexity that's um, also mirrored by other people like Richard Lewontin and others is that a system, what makes a system complex is the number of perspectives that are valid and that you can take on it. So complex systems can be looked at from many different perspectives and they're all good for something. Perspectives cannot be ordered hierarchically. They, they don't just add up in this very clean way because of the structure of reality. It's not clearly structured. So they, they're messy, they intersect, they complement. Hopefully they don't contradict each other too much, but they do uh, sometimes. And so uh, they don't add up to a complete or a clean picture of the system. They just give you um, different answers to different questions you have about the same system. Whether or not you have the right perspective, and that is very important, I'll say that again, will depend crucially on what your question and your problem is, what your take is. Um, uh, on reality. So it depends crucially on how you as a person or as a community or as a society interact with reality. So that's very, a very important aspect that we're going to come back to in the next lecture. Keep that in your mind. So this leaves us with a huge problem that we've already had at the beginning. We, we, we're back at, at square one. How can you justify scientific knowledge in this view of the world. Everything is just your own perspective. What is real? What is trustworthy? We need, as Wimsatt says, to secure the reliability of our conceptual structures. What does he mean by that? Well, the first thing he says is there is no privileged level of organization. So if you look at the world, if, if you look away from this desert ontology where everything that was real was, was these fundamental elements of the world, now you have this uh, amazing, changing, evolving structure of different levels, okay? And there is no privileged level of organization. So there is no philosophical reason why you want to explain everything in terms of fundamental particles or genes or, or whatever, okay? So especially if you look at a very complex part of the world, you need to look at it across levels. And Wimsatt's fundamental criterion for trustworthiness, which also will bring us back to the question of scientific truths, is a criterion that he calls robustness. And his definition of the truth and how that sort of plays into this discussion uh, of how perspectives give us access to this reality that is there, that will be the topic of the next lecture that I'm going to record right away. So tune in again when we talk about perspectival truth. Thanks for watching. Bye now.